My name is Mary Galinsky. I'm a professor of medicine, infectious diseases, and global health. I head the malaria research program at the Emory Vaccine Center and the Yerkes National Primate Research Center of Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm the principal investigator of the MAPIC project. What this means is that I basically head the project. Uh, I establish the project by bringing together a large international team of scientists, many of them from Emory University, also from the University of Georgia, the Georgia Institute of Technology, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. I've also recruited a number of scientists from different countries where you actually have malaria. So as the leader, I've initiated the project, brought the team together, and now it's my responsibility to build and grow the project. The MAPIC project was created with funding from the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, U.S. government funding. And a requirement of this project is that we are studying both the host and the pathogen. The host being either monkey host, where we do experimental research, or in human beings that are actually infected with the parasite. MAPIC takes a systems biology approach to understanding malaria. What this means in some respects is that you're looking at a much more comprehensive picture of the malaria infection. We're not just studying the parasite's genes or the host response or the parasite's proteins or the fats or lipid changes that take place, for example, in a red blood cell, but we're looking at all together. So when we're doing the systems biology approach, we're in from different blood samples, we may be studying what genes are turned on, in other words, what transcripts are being made from those genes, what proteins are being expressed from those genes, and then as the parasite's changing the red blood cell, what lipid changes are taking place. And we're doing this all in concert at the same time. We're also looking at the immune response in a much broader way than has been done before. Scientists have been looking for years, for example, at what antibodies are made to specific proteins that make up the malaria parasite, or what cellular responses kick into action when the immune response is trying to fight an infection. But we're going to look in a very comprehensive way, more than ever has been done before, about the different immunological factors that come into play to fight an infection. MAPIC is going to be collecting unprecedented amounts of data, thousands of pieces of data on all these different types of science, what we call the omics, genomics, proteomics, lipidomics, metabolomics, and this has never been done before. And to gather this data, there'll be a lot of bioinformatics involved, a lot of analysis of these data, a lot of high-tech computational work being involved. And behind the scenes through the whole time, we involve a number of mathematicians who model what's happening in the course of infection. So a lot of different mathematical formulas will be involved to try to determine and predict what's going to happen, and then we'll revise experiments accordingly based on the advice of the mathematicians. At Emory University, we study the entire malaria life cycle. The parasite is both in a mosquito host and in a human host, or in the case of a lot of the experimental work, a monkey host. So we're interested in understanding how the parasite is infecting the mosquito and then transmitted from the mosquito to the human and back. In MAPIC specifically, we're focused on the blood stage of the disease, how the parasite gets into the red blood cell, and then what happens in the course of the disease. But it's also important to understand the transmission. The parasite is picked up from a mosquito bite, and the parasite grows in the mosquito gut, then develops and moves to the salivary glands. In the salivary glands, the parasite is called a sporozoid. The sporozoites are then injected from the mosquito into the skin, and then they move quite rapidly to infect the liver. After one to two weeks in the liver, depending on the species of the parasite, the parasites are released into the bloodstream, and this time thousands of parasites are released from a liver cell into the bloodstream, and that's when people become sick. An interesting aspect of the MAPIC project is that we're going to understand different species of the malaria parasite. Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, and also Plasmodium nolzi. The two most predominant malaria species in the world are Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. The interesting difference between these two is that Plasmodium vivax has a dormant form in the liver. So when the parasites first enter the liver for both of these species, they'll grow and they'll multiply and 
often there'll then be a blood stage infection subsequently following, and people will be very sick. With Plasmodium vivax, some parasites may remain dormant in the liver and not produce a blood stage infection for weeks, months, or even a year later. As the parasite moves from a person or a monkey to the mosquito and back, it's expressing different genes. The genome of the malaria parasite is over 5,000 genes. But different genes are expressed when it's in the blood, multiplying in the blood, versus when the sexual forms are made, called the gametocytes, that the mosquito picks up. Those are expressing different genes. And then when the mosquito is growing, in the mosquito, the parasites um, undergo fertilization. A male and a female gametocyte unite, and fertilization happens in the mosquito gut. Then a different gene expression happens. Once the parasites then are multiplying in the mosquito gut, they move on to the salivary glands, and yet a different form of the parasite called the sporozoid is produced. The sporozoid then is injected into the skin, and again, another layer of transformation begins to occur as the sporozoid then moves on to invade liver cells. When it invades liver cells, once again, now we're growing and multiplying to form thousands of a new form of the parasite called the merozoite. The merozoites then leave the liver and are invading red blood cells. So there's so many different aspects of the science that we just don't understand. MAPIC is going to carry, you know, be addressing and digging deeper to understand the blood stage of the infection. But in the future, as MAPIC grows, using the technologies that we'll be learning, we hope to understand more about the entire life cycle. In addition to studying Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax, we're also studying this monkey malaria parasite called Plasmodium nolzi. Plasmodium nolzi is in, naturally infects monkeys in Southeast Asia. And in 2004, there were major reports in the literature about the monkey malaria parasite being found in humans. There were hundreds of cases of human malaria caused by the monkey malaria parasite. In other words, a zoonosis was happening. The mosquitoes were biting the monkeys and then biting humans. And these infections were transmitted in, in Malaysia and then in other countries of Southeast Asia. So it's become quite a large public health problem. But interestingly now, we'll be not just studying the human side of this story, but also studying Plasmodium nolzi in monkeys, the rhesus macaques specifically, where it's highly virulent where it could even kill the monkey, but of course we treat these infections, so the monkeys are fine. But also we'll be studying in another monkey host called Macaca fasciculoris, which is the natural host. And the monkey, infects the, the monkey malaria infection is much less severe. So we'll be able to do comparisons from a scientific point of view. What makes the parasite extremely virulent in this monkey and not so virulent in this monkey? And we're going to learn a lot about the malaria infection in the process. So in MAPIC at Emory University, we'll be beginning infections with monkeys, uh, starting with the sporozoite form of the parasite, which is isolated from the salivary glands of the mosquitoes. The mosquitoes are actually being infected at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We'll be isolating the sporozoites from the salivary glands and infecting the animals. Then within a matter of days after the parasites are emerging from the liver into the blood, which is where the illness occurs, we'll be taking samples of blood on a daily basis for certain aspects of our monitoring every other day or on multiple different time points in the course of 100 days. We'll be interested in monitoring very carefully how the parasites are rising in a blood stage infection and then also how the blood cells are changing. Uh, and also what's happening in the bone marrow. So we'll be looking in the blood and the bone marrow. That's important because as the parasite is growing in, infect, growing in a, a red blood cell and the red cells are bursting, a person or an animal starts to become anemic. It's losing the infected red blood cells, but it's also for reasons we don't completely understand, losing uninfected red blood cells. So anemia is setting in. And we're monitoring the anemia as it sets in. As the parasites are rising, you begin to have anemia set in. And then the bone marrow needs to produce new red blood cells. But when a person or an animal is infected with an e um, malaria, parasites, that bone marrow doesn't function properly. We want to understand how that 
why that is, what's wrong with the bone marrow. So we'll be collecting blood samples to study this whole process, but also bone marrow samples at particular time points in the course of the 100-day infection. The immune profiling core of MAPIC aims to understand the immune response to malaria in a fashion that hasn't been done before. Much more detailed level, understanding the, uh, particularly the cellular responses that occur in a host. And it's very interesting that the parasite generates a major immune response, and sometimes it can begin to reduce the number of parasites, but it doesn't always clear those parasites from the host. And there's just so much we don't understand as to why. So how does an immune system actually facilitate the elimination of the disease, but not necessarily to completion? Another aspect of the immune response that is very interesting is that children, for example, will build up immunity and then be able to survive with parasites. They won't feel sick anymore. They'll have the parasites, but again, they're not cleared. However, if they, those children grow up and they leave their home environment where they're being bitten on a regular basis by infectious mosquitoes, they could lose some of that immunity. So then they return home and they can become very sick once again. Malaria is present in about 100 countries worldwide, largely in sub-Saharan Africa, but then in many other parts of the world, for example, South America, different parts of Asia. And it's uh, obviously a big problem from a health perspective, but also socioeconomic perspective. Each year, several hundred million people become very sick with malaria. And each year, close to a million people die of malaria. Most of those tend to be children. But that's not always the case. Adults are also vulnerable and could potentially die of the disease. The way we do science has been changing in the last five to 10 years, but particularly the last five years, we see quite a shift and it's been quite dramatic. We've had the genome sequenced for many different organisms recently. And initially, scientists wanted to know what transcripts are being made from the DNA, what RNA transcripts are being made. And then there was the interest to know what proteins are being made. So there we were basically the birth of the genomics field, the transcriptomics and the proteomics. But now we're going much further beyond that. We want to understand the lipids that are changing in the course of an infection. And that becomes the field of lipidomics, or what metabolites are changing, the field of metabolomics, and so forth. So in our project in MAPIC, we're going to be looking at all these different components and applying a mathematical model and informatics people who bring all the data together to help make sense of this and put it out there in the world in the form of major databases so that scientists around the world can use these data. As we study these malaria infections using all these different technologies, we're basically paving the way for how we might study other types of diseases, for example, tuberculosis, HIV, hepatitis C, and others. Also, we, we're going to learn how to study co-infections. In many parts of the world, people can be infected with Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax and even other malaria parasites at the same time. We're going to begin to be able to tease out what is the difference in how one is sick with one parasite, the other, or when they're in co-infection in the same time. Uh, we're also going to be able to maybe use this kind of knowledge that we're developing with MAPIC to study co-infections of TB and malaria, HIV and malaria, and so forth. An interesting part of the work that we'll be doing with the metabolomics is going to come from the studies of malaria in different parts of the world. Now, when we understand the metabolome of people from different parts of the world, first we're looking to see what are the differences of a malaria infection in people from Colombia, Brazil, Papua New Guinea, etc., different parts of Africa, whoever becomes involved. We'll learn about the metabolism of parasites in these different countries and people from different parts of the world. But metabolome also encompasses so much more. We might begin to learn something about the diet and the nutrition of people in one place versus another and how that might make a difference in fighting the disease. Also, environmental factors are different. And when you, you know, just think of the metabolism as, you know, from a drop of blood, but that can incorporate or take into consideration what enters the body from different ways, on the skin, through the mouth, through the, you know, as we breathe in different substances, that could show up in the metabolome. Yeah. 
So this project is relatively new. We just started a few months ago, and already what we're seeing is that it's attracting different types of people. People are interested, in, number one, because it's such a big global problem, but the fact that we're studying at this high-tech level, at the cutting edge of science, is a certainly attractive. The fact that we're learning about people and disease around the world is attractive, and we're just, again, seeing this as a magnet for different types of people, whether they're scientists who want to become involved, other public health specialists and doctors who want to know more about what we're doing, and potentially donors who just want to jump in and say, you know, I, I'm interested, I want to take on and see how I can assist. And I said from over 30 years ago, no one will want to be left out. This disease is so interesting as well as a big health problem. There's so many different ways that people can help to solve the problem. As we go forward, we're very open-minded about the directions that MAPIC can take. We see that we have a game plan for five years, but we also know that we don't know where we're going to be six months from now. The project is moving and developing so rapidly, and as the data starts to come and be processed by the scientists, and we're talking thousands of bits of data, we're going to see new things, we're going to learn new things, and we're going to uh, need to involve more and more people if we're going to begin to look at what we call the black boxes that we've been opening and re realizing we don't know more about this area. We can learn more about that area. And I can give you one example. We had a group of mathematicians, biologists, and immunologists in the same room just last week and uh, beginning to discuss their directions for MAPIC and how we would start to work together on certain questions. And we realized, okay, we know about this aspect of the immune response, but we really don't ha know what happens when this particular type of cell is activated. And so that itself can become a very specific project of interest to immunologists who would come on board. And so we see ourselves as the group that can start to reveal a lot of the knowns, but so many more unknowns that need further involvement of people. So we do welcome new newcomers to join MAPIC or perhaps just work on new projects that can be developed from MAPIC. It's very exciting uh, for us as scientists that even in the short time that MAPIC has been launched, we're delving much deeper into the science than we had realized we, that was possible. Different technologies are coming on board, different scientific thinking is coming on board, and newcomers are being attracted because of this.